I'm Matsuko Konatake. I'm Assistant Professor of International Law here in Utrecht. This week, I would like to talk about international law on peace and security. And I really like this area of law because it illustrates how the international legal order has moved from the decentralized collection of states to a community sharing common interests and the institutions that manage those interests. So I'd like to begin the lecture with a specific story. In September 2014, United States, together with its allied forces, has begun airstrikes against the Islamic State, known as ISIS. Not only in Iraq that gave authorization to the United States, but also in Syria. And not surprisingly, not only the Syrian government, but also Russian administration have criticized the US-led air, airstrikes as a violation of international law. So the question we need to answer is what kind of international law are these countries were talking about? The fundamental principle in this area of law is provided in Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, the Charter of the United Nations. So I'd like to talk about two things. One is the history leading to the establishment of Article 2, Paragraph 4, and the de definition, the interpretation of Article 2, 4 itself. So the first history. Until the beginning of the 20th century, to wage war was considered as one of the instruments of sovereign state. So it was perfectly possible for a state to go to war without violating the principles of international law. And this basic freedom is related to the idea of sovereign equality. Unless state agree to restrict or prohibit war or the use of force, there is no rule. There, is, there are no rules. But the history has changed because of the occurrence of World War I. So in 1919, at the Paris Peace Conference, the state adopted the Covenant of the League of Nations. And the Covenant of League of Nations was significant for two reasons. First, for the first time in history, as many as 63 states have agreed to limit the, 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 their entitlement to go to war. Second, under Article 16 of the Covenant of League of Nations, at least certain limited economic sanctions were envisaged. But, as you know, League of Nations is not considered as one of the most successful stories. And there are many problems, but I'd like to say two things. First, prohibition of war was a limited one. So according to Article 12 of the Covenant, the states were prohibited to go to war for three months uh, after a judicial decision or the Council's report was issued. But after three months, there was no prohibition. Second, perhaps most critically, the United States did not join the League of Nations because of the opposition from the US Senate. The more comprehensive prohibition, prohibition of war came in 1928, thanks to the initiatives of the US Secretary of State, uh, Frank B. Kellogg, and French Foreign Minister, Aristide, uh, Aristide Briand. But despite these attempts to limit or prohibit war, it was not possible to prevent yet another world war. So let's look at the wording of Article 24 itself. So Article 24 prohibits a use of force, not war. So prohibition was much more comprehensive compared to, for instance, a 1928 Kerok Briand Pact. And there has been a huge debate, especially in 1970s, whether or not the, this force, prohibited force, includes not only the military force, but also economic force. But in general, force is understood to mean military force. 
And if you look at the, the, the terms of the provision, the Article 24 prohibits not only the use of force, but also threat of force. And according to International Court of Justice Advisory Opinion in 1996 on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, if the use of force is illegal, threat of doing so is also illegal under Article 24. And Article 24, prohibition of use of force, is about international relations, prohibition in international relations. So this provision has nothing to do, nothing to do with the governmental use of force within its own territory against individuals or private entities. Finally, uh, Article 24, under Article 24, prohibited use of force is one against the territorial integrity or political independence of states or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. And there has been a huge debate, once again, whether or not these terms would restrict the scope of prohibition. But in general, especially if you look at the drafting process of the UN Charter, it is relatively clear that these terms were added not to restrict the prohibition, but rather to strengthen the principle of the non-use of force. And it's very really important to remind you that Article 24 has been reinterpreted, reinterpreted, strengthened, and given detailed meaning through a series of the UN General Assembly resolutions, including the one adopted in 1970 uh, called Friendly Relations Declaration, although the actual name is much longer and the definition of aggression adopted in 1974. So it's very important to look at, these, look at these resolutions as well in order to understand the meaning of Article 24. So going back to the initial story, the US-led airstrike could in principle violate Article 24, the prohibition of the use of force. But there are two exceptions to Article 24. One is self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter, and the other one is military enforcement measures under, Article, uh, under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. So in the next clip, I'd like to talk about the first exception, self-defense. 